Well, this is uh, going to be, not that the others haven't been interesting, but this is interesting because we really don't get to the star of the show until about halfway through this. Because we have to set it up and we have to see what Saul did with re reference to David and how that relationship bombed after David killed Goliath. And then Doeg, I don't know if it's Doeg, Doeg, or Dog, or whatever, but his, he is one of those who is an opportunist, or is he so loyal to Saul that he'll do whatever Saul tells him to do? And loyalty is good, but it's, it, it has its limits. You know, slaughtering 85 people is probably, I'm going to go on the record here, is beyond the limit. <laughs> I would say we don't agree on that. All right, we're going to start out, though, with how David characterizes Mr. Doag in uh, Psalm 52. David wrote this when uh, Doeg the Edomite had gone to Saul and told him, David has gone to the house of, of uh, Himelech. And that's when Doeg basically tattles on David. Hey, boss, they just were. And we'll talk about that. But here it is. Why? And Think about the character of this man, no way. This sets it out. Why do you boast of evil, you mighty hero? Now that is, the mighty hero is like, aren't you really a big shot? You know, it's not, it's not a compliment. He's not a mighty hero. Why do you boast all day long? So we see he is evil. He's boastful. You are you who are a disgrace in the eyes of the Lord, in the eyes of God. We can actually stop right there, and that that would sum it all up. But he goes on. You practice deceit. Your tongue plots destruction. It is like a sharpened razor. Now you've had uh, my grandmother used to use the term. He's got a sharp tongue, and that was not a compliment. And it is here. It is, you love evil rather than good, falsehood rather than speaking the truth. You love every harmful word, you deceitful tongue. Oh, he's, he's kind of laying it on the line there. Surely God will bring you down to everlasting ruin. <coughs> he will snatch you up and pluck you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. Now that's kind of a, a backdoor way of saying you're going to die. Because he will pluck you from the land of the living. The righteous will see fear, see and fear, but they will laugh at you, saying, Here now is the man who did not take God his stronghold, make God his stronghold, but trusted in his great wealth and grew strong by destroying others. And that is something that the author talks about and his personal examples. Because if I haven't mentioned it, he was he was an engineer at NASA. And NASA is a very competitive place. And for promotions and so forth, he talked about how there were those who would try to destroy others in order to get an advancement in, in uh, being promoted. You know, I'm you know, I've got all of these good things about me. I'll tell you, Steve is real stinking. Okay. So now, and we're in competition for that promotion, and I'm putting you down. It's fine for me to say this is what I, this is my uh, resume, but uh, I should not be giving a resume on a competitor. And he saw that a lot. And we're talking at NASA, we're talking some very high paying jobs. So the competition, I'm sure, was very fierce. But uh, back now, back down to Psalm 52, we've gone from the space age back to the Old Testament. But, um, but I, this is what David says, but I am like an olive tree, flourishing in the house of God. I trust in God's unfailing love forever and ever. For what you, God, have done, I will always praise you in the presence of your faithful people. And I hope I will hope in your name, for your name is good. Very big contrast there uh, between the wedge and um, the man, the uh, uh, David. And David was, of course, after God's own heart. 
Was he perfect? Absolutely not. Nobody is, except Jesus. He was. Now, let's go to Samuel. 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17, 55 through 58. We're going to start watching Saul and David's relationship here and how it did not take very long for Saul to turn it south. And we see Saul is going to be very clearly a uh, paranoid, very clearly two-faced, very clearly very violent, and we'll, we'll go through all of that. Something to look forward to today. Now, this is verse 55. As Saul watched David going out to meet the Philistine, this is, of course, Goliath, he said to Abner, who was Saul's commander, commander of the army, Abner, who is this young man? Well, David was a young man. He was a boy at that time, almost. Abner replied, as surely as you live, your majesty, I don't know. Now, the lead-in, as sure as you live, your majesty, is kind of like taking an oath. You know, I always like people who say, hey, I'll be honest with you. Well, what were you before? <laughs> kind of like, what were you before? Um, but in this, he's saying, as surely as you live, your majesty, I don't know. The king said, find out who, whose son this young man is. As soon as David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul. And this is very interesting. With David still holding the Philistines' head. All right, we're invited to go to the White House. I advise you to leave severed heads home. <laughs> if you ever get invited, or to the governor's mansion or some, something you get before the king here. But it brings in the Philistines' head. And at 58, there, verse 58, whose son are you, young man? Saul asked. David said, I am the son of your servant, Jesse of Bethlehem. So he is very respectful, David. Very respectful of the king, even though by this time Saul had basically uh, he was not letting God guide his life and guide his reign. And even though he get a reign for forty years, a lot a lot of the latter part of that, or all of the latter part of it, was not God was not blessing. Him. He was not seeking wisdom and guidance from God. All right. So the introduction went very smoothly, other than the head being brought, but the introduction went very smoothly, and there was nothing unusual about it. All right, now we're going to go to 1 Samuel 18, which is basically uh, continuing where we were, uh, 1 Samuel 18, verses 1 through 13. We see here, um, this is right after <laughs> Saul had met um, David and knew who he was, the son of Jesse. Uh, we see a growing fear of David. Saul has a growing fear of David. Now you can imagine what's going through Saul's mind because Saul is the king and David has killed Goliath the Philistine. Nobody gave him a chance of doing that. It was this kid with a slingshot who's going to take out one of the mightiest warriors the Philistine, Philistines had. <clears throat> After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan, who we know as Saul's son, became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him. What's the old uh, adage? Keep your friends close and keep your enemies close. <laughs> so I think that's maybe what he was doing. I don't know. At this point, it might be too early to tell, but... It, as we see what happens, yeah, it is very likely that, that this is why he did it. And um, with him, he did not let him return home to his family. Well, I think what he's trying to do is keep David around for, you know, his his status. He's the one that killed That's Goliath, true. so it's like, okay, I want to keep this guy around because, you know, Boost my status up. Yes, my status will be boosted because the pe the company I keep, yeah, you know, tell me tell people a lot about me. Well, not really, <laughs> not really. But I think that's what it's thinking. Uh, yeah, sure. And he's an egotistical individual, as we will see. Uh, and Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow. 
So he gave him quite a bit. Jonathan and David were very close. That's why a couple weeks ago we talked about, maybe last week or the week before, when we talked about killing David uh, for uh, what he had done in killing Abner and Jonathan just doesn't make any sense because they had this great relationship. <laughs> now, whatever the mission Saul sent him on, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. Now, there's another reason for keeping him around. He was a very good leader of, of um, troops here. So he sent him on a combat mission. He did well. Did well again. <clears throat> this pleased, this the thing that pleased all, uh, uh, all the troops and Saul's officers as well is the fact that Saul gave David a high rank in the army. Now, I'm sure there were those who were much, much older and much more experienced than David, who, as we used to say in the military, got passed over for promotion. But it, it didn't seem to affect them. At least these. So uh, they seemed to see his leadership capabilities. Yeah. And weren't, and weren't, you know, against him, them being passed over for that. Right, right. This pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. Now, of course, this is going to be at the heart of the problem because now we see Saul's troops and officers are have a great deal of respect for David. Well, Saul, while he wants him around to boost him, doesn't want him to overshadow him. And that's where the problem is going to come. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs, and with uh, timbrels and lyres, as they danced, they sang, uh oh, this was bad news, bad news. Saul has slain his thousands, chuckle, chuckle, and David has tens his of tens of thousands. Rock, row, now the battle lines are drawn here. And what's Saul's reaction? <clears throat> he says, What a wonderful man David is. No, Saul is very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. He's not just angry, he's very angry. And it didn't just, oh, you know, kind of displeased him. No, it did very translation <laughs> says it galled him. It galled him. Yeah, there's another way. It galled him. He was jealous of David's success. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So his idea of keeping him, but anyway, they have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but maybe only thousands. Have you ever known somebody who, Maybe something good happens to you or to me, and that somebody comes up and it's like the congratulations for it is just like, oh man, thank you. I can do without that. You know? Thank you for boosting my morale. But anyway, he was very angry, but they have, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? Now there's the problem. Saul wants the kingdom for Jonathan. God doesn't want it for Jonathan. And God is the one who put Saul there. And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. Okay? The next day, an evil or harmful spirit from God came force forcefully on Saul. We talked about this, I think it was either last week or the week before, um, about does God deliberately harden somebody's heart, or does God say, oh, oh you, get the, you get the evil spirit, or is it that God knows Saul and knows that these things are going to happen? They probably already, they probably already have. We didn't go into a lot of, of uh, Saul's reign, because it, it gets off the, the point of the, uh, the lesson, but Paul or Saul did not have a good latter part of his reign. He was not he was not listening to, to the uh, men of God. He was not listening to the prophets. He was not seeking God's guidance and wisdom. He was doing it all on his own. He was uh, prophesying in his house while David was playing the lyre, the lyre, as he usually did. So David is there playing music to try to calm and soothe Saul. Some people uh, listen, a lot of people listen to music, and, and it helps. 
Now, some of the music, I mean, it's so loud, it's so loud. What it does help is impair the hearing. But as far as settling someone or soothing someone, that's what that's what uh, David was doing. And this was something that David usually did. So this was not a one-time kind of outlier. This is what he did. And we're going to see this. Saul had a spear in his hand. Now I envision there are some people who may sit around their house with a 12 gig shotgun in their lap, right? They're always going to be prepared. Well, this is kind of the way Saul is going, because we're going to see a spear and Saul go well together. He had a spear in his hand, and he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. Well, I'm thinking he's probably not going to pin him by the foot to the wall. It's going to be by the chest and abdomen to the wall. In other words, he's getting ready to kill him. But David eluded him, not once, but twice. So the relationship, I would say, at this point between Saul and David has soured. Somebody throws a spear at me twice trying to kill me. I, I kind of say, I don't like you anymore. You know? But we don't see that happen here. David is afraid of Saul, and he, uh, he goes on the run. But he doesn't, he doesn't really disrespect him at this point, at least what I'm told he does. Saul was afraid of David. And why was he afraid of David? Because the Lord was with David, but had departed from Saul. <clears throat> he is afraid of David for the wrong reasons. He should get back in good graces with God. And it's possible to do. We've seen it happen. We saw Achan kill, who did all the damage he did, and he asked for forgiveness. I've sinned. And the one who did the uh, did other things that God, uh, I have sinned, that can get him back in good graces. But he's what he's looking at is rather than doing that, he wants to eliminate David. Eliminate the problem by eliminating David, not by getting back in grace, good graces with God. So while this is not about <coughs> Saul, but that's a lesson we can learn from Saul. A, a bad guy at this point, he certainly is, we can learn a good lesson from him. We can get back in, in with God, no matter how far we go. As long as we're breathing, and as long as we're sincere about our repentance, we can get back in, in uh, uh, good stead with God. So he sent David away from him. Ooh, now we're doing this. We're kind of doing the Uriah the Hittite routine here. Sent him away from him and gave him a command over a thousand men. And David led the troops in their command, in their campaign. Now, now I don't know. It doesn't say here, and I'm reading between the lines. I'm not even reading between the lines. I'm kind of making it up. But we might say that he sent David out in hopes that, oh, no, getting a message from the front that David's been killed. He'd have his spear in his hand. Oh, no, you can just see that. Um, that may have been behind it. He didn't, in other words, Saul and David aren't together now. They were in the palace. They were at the very beginning. <laughs> Saul kept David with him. Well, man, let's put him out there and see what happens. <laughs> All right, now let's go to Samuel 19, <coughs> uh, 1 through 10. Saul told uh, his son Jonathan and all his attendants to kill David. Now, apparently Saul didn't know very much about Jonathan, or if he did, this was kind of a stupid thing to say. Because Jonathan was great friends with David. So son, go out and kill your best friend. Okay? Do it for dad. Just do it for good old dad. But Jonathan had taken a great liking to David. We already know that. And Jonathan stands up to his father. The king, my father Saul is looking for a chance. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. He warns David. He goes to David and warns. My father Saul is looking for a chance to kill you. Be on your guard tomorrow morning. Go into hiding and stay there. I will go out and stand with my father in the field where you are. And I'm assuming it's the battlefield, not the cornfield. I'll speak to him about you and I will tell you what I find out. 
Now, this is kind of a contrast with what we're going to see no edge do. No edge is going to say, get information and, and tell the king about it. But Jonathan is going to get information from the king and tell David about it, but it is to protect his plan. There's a different motive there. I think no edge was doing it to you know, pump himself up. You've always, I'm sure many of you have worked in a company where you've got a boss and there's always a little strap, we call them strap hangers because if you wear the wear the pat backpack here, there's little straps on it. Well, and they kind of hang on to that as they go around. They're kind of strap hangers. <clears throat> and I think that's what no edge turned out to be. But we'll find out. I'll leave it to you. Okay. So uh, Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king do wrong to his servant David. He has not wronged you. So Jonathan has the backbone to go tell his dad about this, the king. And what he has done has benefited you greatly. Wake up. He took, uh, his, he took his life in his hands when he killed the Philistine. Nobody gave David a chance of killing the Philistine. He was going to be a casualty that day. So he did. When he went against Goliath, he went against the warrior, the war machine. And what? And um, the Lord won a great victory for all of Israel. Now the Lord he's talking about there is God. Not, it's in caps there. And you saw it and were glad. Why then would you do wrong to an innocent man like David, killing him <clears throat> for no reason? Saul listened to Jonathan and took this oath. If you're going to take an oath, better carry it out, right? You see this example. As surely as the Lord lives, now that he can't say as surely as I the king live, he's got to, as surely as the Lord lives, David will not be put to death. Really? <laughs> really? All right. So Jonathan called David. <laughs> sounds like today got him on the cell phone called David and told him the whole conversation he brought him to Saul and David was with Saul as before so now we're kind of back to where we were where there was a, at least a harmonious somewhat of a harmonious relationship between David and Saul once more war broke out and David went out and fought the Philistines he struck them with such force that they fled before him once again, he is earning that reputation, reinforcing an earned reputation, starting with Goliath and continuing to this point as well. Uh, but an evil or harmful spirit of the Lord came to Saul as he was sitting in his house with his spear in his hand. Here he is again, carries that spear everywhere he goes. Uh, while David was playing the liar, liar, Saul tried to pin him to the wall with the spear. But David eluded him as Saul drove the spear into the wall. Well, at this point, I think David's had enough because the next verse, or the next statement there is that night, David made good his escape. You know, if you um, burn me once, shame on you. Burn me twice, shame on me. The first time, Saul, yeah, he, could, he could let it go. But the second time, uh-uh, we're going. Now we go down to, uh, I say go down because on my list it goes down, but in your book it goes left to, in the Bible, it doesn't go down. But 1 Samuel 20, now we'll look at 1 Samuel 20, verses 30 through 34. Now this was giving a setting here. This was the first day of the Feast of the New Moon, which was a two day event. And Saul and his son Jonathan are discussing David. Now, Jonathan undoubtedly heard what went on earlier about the second attempt with the spear. Saul's anger flared up at Jonathan, and he said to him, You son of a perverse and rebellious woman. Now notice, he puts all the blame on her mom. I had nothing to do with the way you are the way you are. It's your mother, that, that perverse and rebellious woman. I wonder if Mom knew it. Well, we won't go there. 
<clears throat> to a domestic violence event. Don't I know that you have sided with the son of Jesse? Now that's interesting too. Remember we talked last week about Eli's sons that weren't named. It, that, was, that was kind of a backhanded disrespect kind of thing. And he's doing it here, son of Jesse. To your own shame and to the shame of the mother who bore you. Well, now mama comes back in and it can be used in both ways. She's the reason you're perverse and rebellious, but you don't want to bring shame on her. As long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Now send someone to bring him to me, for he must die. That was another of the problems. Saul wanted his way as to who succeeds him. And since this, he was the first king, we don't have any uh, line of succession. You know, Great Britain, they know exactly who will assume the throne when uh, Elizabeth the, uh, the second passes. They've got that line. When, if the president is unable to serve or dies in office, we have a vice president. It's not one of these things where it's set up. But here, there was no pattern for it. He was the first king. So everything was kind of, and did God really want them to have a king? No, he did not. And he said, you will not be happy with this. You're going to rue the day you asked for it. Which is one of the lessons, be careful what you ask for, because you really might get it. And they did. So, anyway, um, it goes on at verse 31 there. As long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Now send someone uh, to bring him in, for he must die. Now Jonathan <coughs> has very deep uh, feelings for him, that it is a it is a relationship with David. They have like very, brothers. Yeah, well they were. And probably better than uh, a spoiler alert here, in the uh, first service, Dale talked about uh, who was it? Jacob, the Esau, and who's his brother? Jacob? <laughs> Jacob and Esau. Well, they were brothers. Yeah, one got the pea suit, the other got the uh, got the birthright. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I spoiled it for <laughs> you, but you already know. <laughs> no, no. <I'm> <laughs> and, and, and this is the other thing, too, about that. <clears throat> He had no way of getting food from somewhere. <clears throat> great hunter. Yeah, he's supposedly this great hunter. And that's what he was at. Well, probably he was out doing it, and it didn't work out. Uh, and he didn't have anything. But And pea soup? I mean, that's what lentil soup is. Right? It's only the pea soup. I don't know that, uh, well, that's a whole other lesson. Dale does a much better job than I ever could on that one. But... Um, Uh, in verse 32 there, why should he be put to death? What has he done? Jonathan asked his father. But Saul hurled the spear he always has at Jonathan to kill him. So here he is saying, we've got to establish a kingdom so that you can succeed me, but I may kill you in the process. This man is, he is way out there now. He has got some serious I know this is going to surprise you. Serious mental health issues. Mm -hmm. right. He lashed out in anger, basically, is what he is. He, he acts he, out he in anger. If he can't get his way, then he lashes out. And he is a, an egocentric. He is a paranoid. He's paranoid. That's well, he's totally, why he's he's totally rebellious against God. Yes. You know, before, whenever he was first uh, anointed king, Saul was a very humble man. Yes, he was. But power corrupted, and uh, he didn't listen to God's prophet. Sure. He did what he wanted to. One guy and, and, and Prophet Samuel told him, he says, uh, this kingdom will be taken away from him. Right? Well, instead of listening to God's word, he became political. <clears throat> he became power hungry. And now he's rebelling totally against God to keep his kingdom, which he feels like is his by right now. And God has different plans. Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. 
And what's interesting about it is he keeps that sort of that uh, spirit with him. And I think that's part of the paranoia of this guy. He is so afraid somebody is going to come after him. Although there's no evidence in anything we've read so far that indicates anybody had a plot against the king. <clears throat> Here we go. Uh, and then Jonathan knew, <laughs> yeah, that would wake you up, that uh, his father intended to kill David. I mean, if he would try to kill his kill Jonathan, Jonathan knows he's not going to have a problem trying to kill David. Either. Jonathan got up from the table in fierce anger. That's kind of like father, like son here, maybe. On the second day of the feast, he did not eat because he was grieved at his father's shameful treatment of David. <clears throat> now, Jonathan probably, truth be told, would have made a, better, a much better king than Saul. But that is not what God's plan was. So, we see, as we close that chapter, we're probably all wondering, where is this Doeg guy? Okay, well, he's coming. And you say, well, so is Christmas. Well, yeah, it'll be, we'll get to Doeg before the next Christmas. Yeah, I guarantee that. But here we go, 1 Samuel 21, 1 through 9. Uh, David is at Nob. David, now what has happened here is he's a marked man. He knows it. Jonathan probably has related to him all of the events that, that happened at the feast, the first day of the feast of the moon, new moon. And David sees that if he'll try to kill Jonathan, his own son, he'll, he'll kill me. So he sought sanctuary in Nob, and this is a couple of miles from Saul's capital in Gibeah, uh, and knew uh, Himelech, the high priest, was a good man. And Ahimelech, we talked about last week, was um, succeeded Eli when Eli and his two sons died. So he now is a, the high priest here, uh, or the priest. And he uh, says that uh, also he knew that uh, Ahimelech was good. He could trust him. So David went to Nob there, verse 1 to 20, uh, chapter 21, 1 Samuel. To Ahimelech the priest, Ahimelech trembled when he met him and asked, why are you alone? Why is no one with you? Well, Ahimelech sees something is, uh, is drastically wrong here. Because here's, here's David coming to him by himself. And um, David answered Ahimelech the priest, the king has sent me. Now, this, this is making up now, folks. Making this up. This king sent me on a mission and said to me, no one is to know anything about the mission I am sending you on. Kind of like, um, what was that show years and years ago? Mission Impossible. Yes. If you decide to accept this mission, the secretary will deny all knowledge of it, and off we go. Um, no one is to know anything about the mission I am sending you on. As for my men, I have told them to meet me at a certain place. Now then, now that we get past that, I need something. What do you have on hand? Well, they went to the uh, refrigerator and the freezer and they, well, give me five loaves of bread or whatever you can. Fine. David is desperate here. But the priest answered, David, I don't have any ordinary bread on hand. However, there is some of the consecrated bread here, provided the men have kept themselves from women kept themselves clean. He can give it to them, I guess. But at this point, uh, uh, Jesus in the New Testament, of course, we know, refers to this. <clears throat> when the Pharisees are there with their little tablet checking off things that they're doing, uh, one of the things was they went and harvested the grain. You know, they got the, <clears throat> about like this and then ate it. His <clears throat> disciples did, and now oh, they're working on the Sabbath. They're out there harvesting. But and, then, and Jesus refers to it saying that <laughs> desperate times need desperate measures sometimes, in effect. When the priest, um, uh, David then replied there at verse 5, Indeed, women have been kept from us uh, as uh, usual where, whenever I set out. The men's bodies are holy, even on missions that have, are not holy. Uh, how much so? How much more so today? So the priest gave him the consecrated bread, since they had no bread there except that bread of the presence that had been removed uh, from uh, before the from before the Lord and replaced 
by hot bread on the day it was taken. So we then move on. Now one, here we come. Here's Ephod. Or Ephod or Doeg. Doeg. Yeah, Doeg the Edomite is going to make his appearance tonight or today. Now one of Saul's servants was uh, there that day. He was detained before the Lord. Now the, the uh, uh, commentators say he was probably detained for a sinful act. So we already we've already seen quite a bit of uh, Doeg's character in Psalm 52. But in addition, he gets to see David because he is being detained or held because of some sin problem in all likelihood. Um, he was Doeg the Edomite and Saul's chief shepherd. Now, apparently he was also wealthy, given what uh, David says in, in uh, Psalm 52 about you re would rely more, you rely on your wealth and bringing people down rather than relying on God. But uh, David asked Ahimelech at this point, um, don't you have a spear or a sword here? I haven't brought my sword or any other weapon. Here he is on the special mission, supposedly, for the king, and he's unarmed. So, what happens here? Because the king's mission was urgent. Well, apparently so. The urgency was getting out of town before the king killed him. The priest replied, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, is here. It's wrapped, it is wrapped in cloth behind the ephah. If you want it, take it. There is no sword here but that one. So David was in dire straits. He needed food, he needed weapons, he needed all a weapon. David said, there's none like it. Give it to me. All right. And again, remember that Goliath was so big, this is probably a very large sword. And the drama continues. Now, Saul's hatred of David is consuming him. And he is, well, here are the train rails. He's not even on the rails, he's way off the rails here. David left Gath there beginning, I should have told you, 1 Samuel 22. 1 Samuel 22, <coughs> verse 1. <coughs> David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. And this is actually his, his earthly father and his earthly brothers. Uh, and all those who were in distress um, or in debt or discontented gathered around him and he became their commander about 400 men came now David forms his new very small army and apparently I assume they came with weapons otherwise they just had the one big sword <laughs> and you don't need 400 people with one big sword <laughs> that would be about as much as funny as little David and big Goliath but we know how that turned out so maybe it'll work but anyway uh, David then, um, mm -hmm. these men were probably not, not the cream of the crop, but they were willing to support David. From there, David went to Mizpah and Moab and said to the king of Moab, Would you let my father and mother come and stay with you until I learn what God will do for me? <clears throat> he is relying on God. Saul doesn't say anything about that. So he left them with the king of Moab, and they stayed with him as long as David was in the stronghold. But the prophet of Gad said to David, don't stay in the stronghold, go into the land of Judah. So David uh, left and went to the forest of Hiram. Now, once again, we return to Mr. Um, what's his name? Doaz. Doaz. Too many of these people here. Now, now Saul heard that David and his men had been discovered, and Saul seated, was seated with his spear in his hand under the tamarisk tree on the hill of uh, Kabalia, with all his officials standing at his side. He said to them, Listen, men of Benjamin, well, the son of Jesse, once again, not even for <coughs> give all of you fields and vineyards. Will he make all of you commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds? Is that why you have conspired against me? Not a little paranoia there, a lot. No one tells me when my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. 
None of you is concerned about me or tells me that my son, I mean, he's, this is getting to be so childish. Has, inc uh, has incited my servant David to lie and wait for me as he does today. Now he's accusing jo Jonathan. Jonathan is telling him, the old man's going to pass. At this point, at this time, be there and take him out. He will have a spear, by the way, but off you go. Now, that Doeg, the Edomite, who was standing with Saul's officials, said, I saw the son of Jesse come to Abimelech, son of of uh, Ahitub at Nob. Ahimelech inquired of the Lord for him. He also gave him provisions <clears> and the <throat> sword of Goliath the Philistine. Now, why is he telling this to, uh, to Saul? Is he loyal to Saul or is he telling it because he wants to tell on Ahimelech so that he can get rid of Ahimelech or put yeah. him in a bad light, basically, is what he's doing. Yeah, that's exactly yeah, he doesn't want to be a shepherd anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's tired of being the chief shepherd. Yeah, you know I mean, you can be a shepherd and a chief shepherd, and when you've done that, you're probably tired of being a shepherd. But you've gone all the way up to the top. He's hit the glass ceiling, so now he wants something else. Then the king sent for the priest, Ahimelech, and all his men and his family. Never a good thing when the king wants all the family there who were priests at Nob. And they came to the king. Saul said, Listen now. Now he calls a bit Ahimelech, son of Hittimah. Yes, my lord, he answered. And he's very respectful. Saul says to him, Why have you conspired against me? You and the son of Jesse, giving him bread and a sword and inquiring of God for him. So that he has rebelled against me and lies in wait for me as he does today. Now, what might Saul have asked instead of that? Will you inquire of God for me? That would change the whole direction of this. That's not what he did. Ahimelech answered the king, Who of all your servants is as loyal as David? He's going to the, he's going to the map for him. The king's son in law. David was the king's son in law, captain of your bodyguard. Um, yeah, yeah, you don't want to get too. He was the, you know, very high <coughs> place. The bodyguard is not just the ordinary troops out in the field. And highly respected in your household. Was that day the first time I inquired for him? Of course not. Let not the king accuse your servant or any of his father's family, for your servant knows nothing at all about this whole affair. But the king said, You will surely die, Ahimelech, you and your whole family. Then the king ordered the guards at his side, turn and kill the priests of the Lord, because they too have sided with David. And then the king ordered Doeg, you turn and strike down the priests. So Doeg, the Edomite, turned and struck them down. That day he killed 85 men who were in linen ephah. Those are the priests and their assistants. He also put the sword to Nob, uh, to the, he also put to the sword Nob, the town of the priests, with its men, women, and children, and infants, and cattle, and donkeys, and sheep. He didn't, kill, he didn't tell, care who he killed. He did not care. <clears throat> but one son of Abimelech named Abiathar escaped and fled to join David. He told David that uh, Saul had killed the priests of the Lord. Then David said to Abiathar, that day, when Doeg the Edomite was there, I knew he would be sure to tell Saul, I am responsible for the death of you, your whole family. So David takes responsibility for this, even though obviously the one, the two, Saul and Doeg, are the ones who are, are uh, responsible for it. Stay with me. Don't be afraid. The man who wants to kill you is trying to kill me too. You will be safe with me. I don't know that part about the one who wants to kill you is trying to kill me too, but stay with me because you'll be safe. Well, wait a minute. I'm not sure that works that way, but that's what he said. Just in closing, because man, the time went fast. The, um, I'm sure it didn't for you guys. Sure you to <laughs> but uh, the point here is was Doeg acting out of intense loyalty to Saul, or was he trying to push his own agenda? Yeah, there you go. Just like that, uh, Austin talked about so many people at NASA. 
they're pushing themselves with their resume, but they're also putting people down so they have a better chance to be selected. Any closing comments about that? <clears throat> oh, next week, you're wondering. Next week, we have a wonderful person, Herod Antipas. People pleasing and pleasure seeker. We know what he did, right? So we're going to get to do that. We'll basically be at Matthew 14 and Mark 6. Matthew 14 and Mark 6 cover, pretty much cover that. Any uh, any other closing comments? Thank you so very much for your kind attention. Thank you out in the virtual world. Uh, we appreciate you tuning in or zooming in, as the case may be. Thank you.